Hi everyone, welcome to Human to Human. I'm your host Sarah Scher, and this is the very first season of the University of Manitoba's Anthropology Department podcast, where I hope to explore the topic of anthropology through conversation with faculty and students so that everyone can have a better understanding of what anthropology is and can be. This podcast was also created on a campus located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene people in the homeland of the Métis Nation. As a podcast dedicated to anthropology, this project is also a part of the Anthropology Department's commitment to community engagement and research on the rich, diverse, and multifaceted ways of being human. Once again, I'm your host Sarah Scher, and this is Human to Human. Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of Human to Human. I'm Sarah, and today I get to talk with one of my fellow classmates, Kevin Edbert, on their experience of being a student in anthropology at the University of Manitoba, as well as what it has been like to transition from being an undergrad to entering their master's degree in sociocultural anthropology. Kevin, thanks so much for being here today and talking with me about anthropology. Hi, happy to be here. Uh, So this is currently reading week for both of us. And it's usually the time when students can take a bit of a breath from their course load and maybe catch up a bit on their favorite TV shows. Are you watching anything right now? It is. um, I'm not watching anything right now. It's more about just me catching up on my sleep um, that I lost through the (laughs) first half of the term. But yeah, I'm having fun relaxing at home. (laughs) Yeah, I agree. It is a nice time to have a week off and catch up on sleep and I guess the rest of our, our readings and our schoolwork. Because you're, you're currently in classes, but you're a master's student, so you're also working on your research work too, right? Yes. In the anthropology master's program in the U of M, the proposals are only to be submitted in the winter term. So we still have a bit of time on getting the proposal done. Okay. And it's not really expected for students to really start working on it in the first term necessarily. Just get like the readings done and then probably work on it on the, sec- on the winter term. Yeah. Well, that makes sense because obviously there's a lot to read in preparation for whatever area you end up going into, into a master's program. And you and me, like, we're also in two of the same courses this semester. We're in public anthropology together and also globalization and transnational migration. But it's been cool because this is actually the first semester that we've met each other in person. But we have had... Oh, my God. (laughs) It's true, right? Because we've had classes before together, but we only ever saw each other on a screen. Yeah, yeah. It's very nice to meet people again and to finally talk to the classmates in in person again. And it really creates a really good atmosphere for discussion because you can finally talk to the person asking questions eye to eye rather than, I guess, like screen to screen back then. So it's really exciting, especially in the 4,000 level, 3,000 level classes, which which are more discussion based. Yeah, I totally agree. I think I also thrive off of being in person with people. And so there was definitely enjoyable moments to having school online Mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, getting to be in your pajamas a lot more and not having to commute. But I'm really enjoying this, this semester back to school in person and, you know, taking the precautions necessary to all stay safe, but it's really nice to finally meet some of my classmates in person and talk about anthropology because obviously I love anthropology. I'm part of making this podcast and I'm taking it in university and finally I get to meet other people who have the same interest as me, I guess. So that's been fun. So Kevin, I also know that you've traveled to Manitoba for the purpose of studying at the U of M and because you're actually from Indonesia. Right? Yes, I am. Could you maybe share with us what part of Indonesia you're from? Yes, I am from Jakarta. Well, okay. not necessarily like Jakarta itself. Jakarta is the capital city of Indonesia. I live nearby. Um, it's called BSD City. It's one of the supporting cities for Jakarta. And okay. what that means is that it houses the workers that work in 
Jakarta because there's just not enough space in Jakarta itself to oh, to house their workers. Yeah, I think that's maybe similar to what we describe as the GTA area mm-hmm. in Toronto and Ontario. It's kind of like Toronto and the GTA. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I, I kind of get what you're saying here. You know, and Jakarta is like a major city in Indonesia, so it's huge. Um, and what was that process of deciding that you were going to travel somewhere to go study for university? And how did you um, end up coming to Manitoba? That's a really good question um, because, like, there's a lot of deliberating, and on top of that process of getting here, I guess when I decided to go here is based on primarily the lower tuition costs as compared to the other Canadian universities. I've also considered going to the U.S. to some extent, but it's just way more expensive in the U.S. anyway. Within Canada itself. There's a couple of well-known universities um, and internationally, like UBC, um, U of T, and Waterloo, and such. Mm -hmm. And Manitoba is actually something that is not that internationally famous. But I I was talking to one of the um, companies that helps um, like high school graduates find universities, and they actually found University of Manitoba there. Yeah, and I, I got recommended University of Manitoba, and I just thought to myself, you know, it's I, it's literally two times or three times cheaper to go here compared to like other university in other universities in Canada. So yeah, and like economic concerns are really important to university students. It's something that we have to consider, right? Because education is expensive. Mm-hmm. Especially as an international student, we pay. I guess a lot more um, intuition mm-hmm. in the first place. So there, it's also um, like a concern for international students at large when deciding to go to like an, an international university. Could you maybe say a little bit about why you you wanted to go somewhere internationally for your university compared to staying in Indonesia? Yeah, yeah, I can talk about that. To some extent, I had like a quite a bitter understanding of Indonesian education system. It's not to say that it's bad, but Mm -hmm. it's very senior-oriented. You said senior-oriented? Yeah. Okay. It's more, so like in Indonesia and much of the Southeast Asian and East Asian culture, um, I would say they have this tenant of respecting elders. And that I think that also affects the education side in a way that uh, when it comes to like the ed- education system, if you disagree with your seniors, it would make it seem that you are belligerent in that system. Mm. And it just doesn't promote the university idea of free thought and all that. Okay. So in a way, you... You were seeking an international university because you were aware that in Indonesia or in Indonesian universities, there is this seniority to people who are older than you and that sometimes doesn't allow free thought or maybe a lot of expression from younger people early on in their university degrees. Uh, Well, I wouldn't say that I know that that is ha- happening. I just had the impression just going through mm. the system in high school and junior high school. But, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give Indonesia the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess for the social sciences area, it's just not as developed in Indonesia as compared to Canada. So there's also that. Well, thanks for mentioning that a little bit. I was just curious. But also... Let's say you were you were at this company and they told you, "Hey, here's the University of Manitoba." What were some of your perceptions of what Manitoba would be like before you oh you God. got here? Huh? I mean, no one knows where Manitoba is. Uh, no one knows where Winnipeg is. So we, as a family, just had to like Google stuff around. And when you Google like Winnipeg, at least in like in, in Indonesia, the first se- search a result that come up is the winter. The winter? Oh no. <laughs> yeah, of course it's the winter. But U of M was also advertised as a university that exists 
in a not so active city. So there's not much in terms of, for example, the nightlife in Manitoba, at least at when it was advertised to to us in the, um, back in Indonesia. Was that something that appealed to you? Uh, it's neutral. Yeah, like, okay. It's, it's fine. Um, but it, le- it really appeals to my, to my parents because, <laughs> I mean, the reason they wanted to send me here is to do some university, so. Okay, so Manitoba appealed to your parents. They were like, no nightlife. This looks like a good place for our son to go and get a university degree. That's funny. <laughs> no nightlife. It's cheap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, but when you came to Manitoba and you entered university, you actually started in kinesiology, right? I did, yes. Oh my god, that's a really long transition from kinesiology. And kinesiology is the scientific study of the human body movement. So can you maybe tell us a bit more about how you ended up going into anthropology? Well, in my first year, I took a class with... um, It's uh, it's Anthropology 1200, Cultural Anthropology side of the introduction. And I thought to myself that it really appeals to my interest to some extent. It's, It's basically like a class introducing the basic tenets of what cultural anthropology is. And I decided to take that class in the second year again. And from the discussions we had in the in the class, it seems to me it's as something that is very exciting and very interesting to pursue. So yeah, just based on that um, first year and second year experience, I decided to why not try and take the third third year again. And then in the end, I've actually finished my undergrad with anthropology. So your your experience is somewhat similar to mine because I also took a cultural anthropology intro course and that's kind of where my interest in anthropology began because before that I wasn't familiar with what anthropology was. No, no one knows what anthropology is. Like, do you know anthropology before the class? No, I didn't. I, I had heard of the term, obviously, and I think maybe similar to a lot of other people, my perceptions of what it was were more about archaeology. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Indiana Jones. Yes, exactly, Indiana Jones. So yeah, I guess that's partly why I'm creating this podcast, right? Because after I took that course, after I've spent several years studying anthropology in my undergrad, I've learned a lot more and I really appreciate everything that the discipline has to offer. And so I really hope that, you know, through these conversations with people like you, we can just kind of show others what we're interested in. And I mean, we're both focused in sociocultural anthropology, like mm-hmm. that subfield. So that's maybe also a subfield that not a lot of people are familiar with either. <laughs> yeah. My parents actually mentioned that to me. Like, what are you doing? What, what is anthropology? Or do you want to be like Indiana Jones or something? <laughs> and I was like, uh, no. <laughs> Well, maybe after this podcast episode is done, you can send this episode to them or something like that. That might be funny. Or maybe not, because we had that little piece in there about <laughs> their their preference for Manitoba. But no, <laughs> no, I think they would understand. <laughs> okay. I think they'll, they'll find it hilarious. So you also got a double major, though, right, in your undergrad in psychology and anthropology? I did. Also during my first year, I've encountered psychology, which is my second major. And I decided to really like psychology during that first year. And it also follows, I guess, the sim- a similar trend to the anthropology side, which is just taking the first year courses and then course and then the second year courses. And it's like, OK, let's take the third year course. And I s- decided to really love psychology and anthropology to some extent. And yeah, like kinesiology, it's really nice to have that in mind um, in terms of the economical freedom, but it's not really something that I'm passionate about. Mm. And yeah. Well, uh, that's that's really sweet to hear that you found your way into anthropology and psychology in your undergrad because it was something you were passionate about. So now you've you graduated with your undergrad in a double major of psychology and anthropology. 
you're living the international student experience here in Manitoba at the University of Manitoba, and you ended up entering your master's degree in sociocultural anthropology at U of M here. And I was wondering if you could both share with us how you became focused within the subfield of cultural anthropology compared to archaeology or biological anthropology, as well as maybe a bit about the process of becoming a master's student, how you chose what area you were going to study, who you were going to have as a supervisor, which school to go to. Hmm. I guess I can start with the decision to undertake cultural anthropology. Uh, I mean, I guess the reason is not that exciting. It's just quite simple. It's really exciting to learn about people and about uh, the culture of different people in the world and how it's, it's affecting their mindset and also like worldviews. In psychology, um, I'm also like interested primarily on the socio, socio-cultural um, subfield. And in terms of the process to, um, in, to get into the master's program, I got really lucky during my last year in anthropology. Uh, I was talking to Lara I was asking her if she has like a volunteer opportunity and she had recommended Derek who is the department head and she she was mentioning that he has a large project going on involving um, people from Southeast Asia and she told me that you might be interested to just um, email him about that and it really just goes on from there in a sense that he became my uh, advisor for my master's. So that was at the end of your undergrad. And Laura is someone, Dr. Laura, is someone that I will be having a conversation with on this podcast as well. So we will be hearing from her. So in a way, you kind of highlighted how connections with our professors are really important in a lot of ways in terms of asking about what opportunities are available for students. Yeah, um, in my experience talking to the faculty members in anthropology and psychology, they've all been very helpful and it's just a positive gain for you to talk to your professors, lecturers. They would know more about what the going on in the department anyway. So if you have if you're unsure about anything, I would say it's always a, re- a really good decision to talk to your faculty members. And I know the research hasn't actually started for you yet in your master's degree because you're still doing all the readings in preparation. But is there a bit more details that you could tell us about what your research is going to be looking at? Yes. The research that I'll be doing for my master's will talk about the well-being of fish processors in Indonesia, and fish processors is a term that we use to describe people who work in the area between um, retailing and producing. So Mm. fish production is just basically fishermen going out to sea and catching the fish, and retail is just like the selling of these fish products. And the processing side is very diverse in terms of their job description. But in my case, the focus is on the dried fish processors. Hmm. So fish drying is just basically the process of putting fish under the sun and let it, letting it dry. And usually people would put salt on it to make it taste salty. And it also preserve the food longevity of that product. I would say the primary reason to for the, these fishermen to to do this drying and the um, and and adding the salt to the product is to increase the shelf life of these products because in those communities they wouldn't necessarily have like a refrigerator for them to use, mm. so they have to find a way to preserve food um, when when it's not fishing season, and. Yeah, so my research will look at the well-beings of the people working in, on that sector and see how, to some extent, it would compare to the other people working on the same sector in, in the other Southeast Asian countries in our research, and also how their understanding of well-being compared to how we understand well-being in Canada and the Western world at large. Hmm, that's very cool. 
And in terms of the fact that you're an international student to Manitoba, but now you're doing anthropological research that connects back to your home in certain ways, what does that mean to you to be able to take your schooling and actually apply it to the communities that you're familiar with? Does it mean something more than maybe studying a community that was in a different place? Oh, that's a really good way to frame it. Huh. I never really think much about that because to some extent when you live in, and this is just my observation, but when you just live primarily in the in an urban area, you wouldn't really relate to the people living in the rural area, especially when the difference is so high in Indonesia. Like I know from um, my experience interacting with people in Winnipeg, those who come from what they describe the bush, which is like the countryside of the Winnipeg, of Winnipeg, they live pretty much similar lifestyle to people who live in like downtown or like the housing near and in, in Winnipeg. But in Indonesia, people living in Jakarta and these smaller villages um, in Indonesia, they live very much a different life. And I know that for a fact because in my high school we did some um, live-ins in these small villages. So to some extent I've been doing anthropology since high school because that's also mm-hmm. like a big thing in anthropology to do the participant observation. Um, just living there and experiencing what feels like to live in that community. But my point is it's a very different life. Um, between the urban area and rural area in Indonesia and I don't really feel that I'm doing a research on my community Mm. um, precisely but I would see it I guess just in line as if I would do the research in like other areas like other countries but I guess minus the difficulty of learning another language Okay, so in terms of your work, you will need to learn another language or no? Not necessarily because they also speak Indonesian and they also have like a local dialect. Like like I can understand what they're talking about, but I wouldn't be able to speak it without raising some I- eyebrows. Okay, fair enough, yeah. I guess that's that's a good point though in terms of people live very different lives even within the same geographical location Mm -hmm. and so that's another like important part of anthropology is really focusing on these unique stories of people Mm -hmm. that might be from the same place but you can never really make generalizations that everyone experiences the same things in the same way and this is kind of a, a case for you right Yeah, like when I said that people in rural Winnipeg area live a similar lifestyle to people living in the urban area, I mean, like I wouldn't know necessarily if if that's true. There might be things that are invisible to my point of view as compared to people who actually live in the rural areas. And it might be interesting to ask them the question, hey, do you think that you are living similar lifestyles to the people living in the urban areas? And I guess reflecting on the statement again, it might not be the case. Like, they might also say that, you know, we we live like 100 kilometers away from the city. We have to grow our own food. We have like our own schooling system. We know everyone in the community as compared Mm -hmm. to like the um, city. But yeah, who knows who the precise answer to that question of similarities between the urban and rural areas. And it's also something that I'm interested in, perhaps to research in the future. Okay. I was also going to ask you if there were certain topics in anthropology that you're interested in researching in the future. So you, you just mentioned kind of the differences of people's experiences from rural to urban life. Is there anything else that you're also interested in? Yes, um, and that comparison between the urban and rural areas, it comes up from another question of how different we really are as people from different cultures. And also something that I'm interested in is how people from different cultures, like like international students, how people from different cultures going into another culture, how they would cope Mm. and how they would adapt to that situation. But 
Yeah, in that area, yeah, my research interest is in that um, comparison area of, you know, urban versus rural, um, Western, quote-unquote, versus Eastern, quote-unquote, cultures. And, yeah, I mean, it's really, it's, it's a really big topic in itself. In the future, I might have to specify which aspect of that broad area that I want to focus on. Mm-hmm. And going back to your studying well-being of fish processors who make dried fish, is dried fish a food that you ate when you were living in Indonesia? Was it quite a common food? It is a really common food, yeah. yeah. Um, I didn't really like it. I find it too salty. But I do, for a fact, know my my mom, um, to be specific, really likes the food. She actually grew up in one of the semi-urban areas in eastern Java. And she used to play, that's the, the word that she, she used, and she used to play in the rural areas. And one of the areas that she was playing in is the fisher villages in Indonesia. And I guess she just got a taste and she decided that she likes it. Yeah. Yeah, so in a way, your studies in anthropology have spread to your parents now and making them perhaps think about things about their own culture and the foods that they eat in a different way, right? So that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess moving on from your research, how has your time studying anthropology, and I guess now as you move into your master's, how has anthropology changed the way you view the world and the people in it? In anthropology, something that we've, that we've been hammered on quite early in anthropology is this escape from ethnocentricity, which is... Um, Judging a culture by one's own culture, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that really resonates quite deeply with me in terms of talking to other people, especially in a such a diverse country such as Canada. In anthropology, we, we learn to not associate people's appearances with their background. And that really changed my um, worldview in talking to other people, asking more questions rather than judging people without, without knowing um, anything from their side. That's a really good point, because I feel like I've had similar thoughts and reflections on my own time in anthropology, and I'm pretty sure that I told a friend recently that if anthropology has taught me anything, it's that I cannot guess someone's ethnicity by the way they look, or their cultural heritage by the way they look. Yeah, yeah. It's something that I've learned um, very quickly coming in Canada. (laughs) And I think that that's also a really good quality to have, though, in terms of anthropology, in a way, asks you to ask more questions and to get to know people and to really learn about the way that they see themselves and the world, too. Mm -hmm. There's also, like, the what you said is the reflexive aspect of anthropology in a way that asking questions to yourself about your own positions in the world uh, or your own position in your community and how it affects the um, community that you are working with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in anthropology, I guess we often um, use the terms positionality and reflexivity, but that's exactly what you're you're referring to here. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So now, based on your time in anthropology here at the university, what is one or two courses that you've taken that you really enjoyed or maybe had an influence on you? I have to say it's the second year anthropology course. It it was revisiting concepts that were introduced in the first year. But what really gotten uh, me into the class is the discussions we have. Because in the class, we allow disagreements so much I feel very fine, I guess, to uh, voice disagreements in the class. And what comes on in the discussions is something that I never really considered. And I think having more disagreements in a class allows you to think more about the other side, about uh, other people's points of view. And yeah, the class just really opens my eye on what anthropology could be. Do you remember the title of this? I do remember the course number is Anthropology 2000. Okay. Yeah, Yeah, I think that's culture, society, power. It's really focusing on these 
on these larger topics that you need to consider in terms of anthropology. Mm -hmm. And in the class, we've also discussed more controversial issues. Controversial in a way, like for example, one of the questions that were asked in the class is the question of um, how anthropologists should behave in their field study. Uh, if they see any, for example, inequalities, can they do something to help alleviate that through... Um, like broader policy work? Yeah, broader advocation. policy work. Advocation, yes. And going out there and protesting, for example. Mm. And anthropology, we had, at least in the conception of anthropology, we had the policy of non-interference, which is to say that anthropologists are expected to not involve themselves in local politics. Uh, presumably, if an, if, anthropo if an anthropologist disrupts the local status quo, people in power in that area would, would be unpleased with the anthropologists and would bar future anthropologists to get into that area. But I would say there's currently there is some advocation against that non-interference edict um, in anthropology, and uh, which is to say like there's quite a bit of a push towards a more active anthropologist. Yeah, I think that there is a lot of questions that anthropologists need to consider in terms of their responsibilities of what they study in the communities that they study in the people's people's lives, right? And it's. There's not a clear answer, I think. It's always a grappling of what is my responsibility? What is the role of the anthropologist? So that's a lot of mm -hmm. good questions that you brought up to think about. And I can see why that, that that second level of your course in cultural anthropology was one of the most interesting, maybe, or influential on you because it's really looking at the basis of if you want to become an anthropologist, you know, who are you and what mm -hmm. is your role? Why do you think that someone should consider taking a, a course in anthropology in university or maybe even getting a major or minor in it? I mean, looking at my experience with uh, anthropology and I guess to some extent your experience with anthropology, you wouldn't know anything if you don't try it. So generally speaking, people should just take courses that they, that they don't have any background about. But what I find uh, most appealing with anthropology is that in a world that is increasingly becoming more interconnected to one another, it is important to have the background knowledge of how people interact with one another um, across cultures. And there isn't really any other discipline um, in the academia that really talked about that. So there's that aspect of going into anthropology as a requirement of engaging in the uh, globalized world. But there's also the lessons that you can learn from anthropology, that reflexive aspect of existing in reference to other people and also understanding um, how people develop their... Um, their worldview? Their worldview, yeah. Those are really good points. Yeah, I like that you, you included both the reflexive aspect of thinking about oneself in this world, but then also considering the fact that we are living in an ever more increasing intermixed, intercultural mm -hmm. space. And anthropology is one way to really be able to look at culture and think about it critically, as well as appreciate differences between people. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, this has been a great conversation, and we're almost at the end of all the time that we have for today. And just as a fun thing, I thought I would ask you a couple of fun questions. So I'm kind of surprising you with this one, but what is maybe one weird or interesting thing that you've noticed that people in Manitoba do or eat or something like that that you you weren't familiar with before you came here? Uh -huh. Ah, that's an interesting question. Well, I guess to some extent with my anthropology background, I wouldn't really find anything weird <laughs> outright. <laughs> okay, okay. But, I mean, recently we've also have the Halloween. Um, yeah, the holiday of Halloween. Yeah, yeah. 
And it's really interesting to see how people go back to the tradition of Halloween after the two years of the lockdown. Um, I was talking to one of my co-workers and I had some concerns that I talked to her because I was thinking after the two years lockdown, people have not been doing um, Halloween trick or treating. Will the tradition die away? And she told me that, no, no, it won't die away. In fact, it might even be more crazier this year because of the lockdown, because of the kids wanting to go out again, trick or treating. And yeah, she was right. Yeah, people, Aww. there's a lot of kids going around in my neighborhood. And that, it's that really is, fun to see. <laughs> that's a really sweet concern that you had. You were concerned that, because Halloween is not a holiday that you celebrate in Indonesia, right? Or you don't celebrate trick-or-treating. You don't participate in that way, right? No, yeah, we don't do trick-or-treating. Yeah, If you go to the malls, there will be some halloween theme shops. Okay. But it, but it was just sweet that you were concerned that a tradition here in Manitoba would die away after the pandemic. But then you noticed that it didn't and you saw all the trick-or-treaters in your neighborhood. I mean, I guess to some extent the reason is I really want to know uh, for a fact if people are doing this. <laughs> um, tradition because it's something that we've only, uh, at least from people outside of the Western world, I don't know if people are doing. I, I think they do trick or treat in like the UK or or like Germany, which you know. I would not know for certain, but it might make sense that 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 is something that also happens there. Maybe in like different unique ways. Yeah, but these Halloween traditions is, are it's only something that we see on TV on like Halloween theme movies and I just want to know for a fact if people are doing these <laughs> tradition but yeah they really do yeah so what was your overall impression of your first Halloween that wasn't affected by the lockdown oh, I just find it very impressive how people goes on a, to that length to decorate their house and I, I've seen some videos of people making these really intricate Halloween contraptions that would like jump scare people when <laughs> when they go to their house using like sensors and all that. Yeah, and the great lengths that people, well, I guess children and sometimes high school students go like, to getting free candy, right? Yeah, yeah, like <laughs> the weird but yet awesome costumes that they would invent. Yeah, Halloween is definitely can be a fun time. And as someone who has trick-or-treated in the past... Those are filled with some good memories, even though it's usually really cold and you're always trying to figure out a way to wear winter clothes, but then also have your costume. And I think that is a really funny struggle of Halloween for most kids. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a point that I was wondering myself about, like, why would you go out in like two degrees um, to get some candies outside? <laughs> it's really interesting. So speaking of Halloween, was there a Halloween candy or treat that you tried for the first time that you really liked? I never gotten myself uh, one of those Halloween candies, personally. Oh, you didn't? Okay. No, but I guess I did try the pumpkin spice from Starbucks. I really liked it. I believe it's like a limited um, edition uh, yes. O- offer. Yes. They, they only offer it like <laughs> during late fall. Yeah, pumpkin spice, the flavor, but also pumpkin spice lattes from Starbucks. Specifically, uh-huh. people get very excited for the fall season because yeah. it, it only comes out during the fall winter season and then it leaves for spring and summer. So I'm glad that you tried that because that's a very, I would say, favorite type of drink that's out here. Pumpkin spice lattes <laughs> Yeah, I don't Starbucks. Think, I don't think we have those in Indonesia. Okay. Cool. Well, Kevin, thanks so much for chatting with me today and sharing with the listeners and I about your experience of being an international student in anthropology at the U of M. I wish you a restful time for the remainder of your reading week. Thank you. You too. So this concludes the sixth episode here on Human to Human. If you're new to anthropology, I hope you're able to gain a better understanding of what anthropology is and also get a glimpse into one student's experience of taking anthropology in university and choosing to pursue it further with a master's degree. I also hope you will join me in the next episode where I do an interview with Dr. Laura Rosanoff-Gauvin, who's a sociocultural anthropologist here at the University of Manitoba. 
In my interview with Dr. L, we get to hear more about how her background in communications and documentary film led her to be a part of filming a documentary about the war happening in northern Uganda back in 2004. And we'll also hear more about Dr. L's continued interests in studying relational repair and indigenous knowledge transmission in communities who have experienced war. If you want to hear more from this podcast, Human to Human is available for listening on several platforms. We are on Spotify, Apple, SoundCloud, as well as YouTube. If you like this episode or have any questions, it would be great to hear from you in the comment section. We also have an email that you can contact the podcast through, and that will be included in the description box down below. I would also like to give a special thanks to the people at UMFM for providing me with the space and equipment to make this podcast possible, as well as the Department of Anthropology for funding this project, and of course, Dr. Laura rosanoff Govan. Dr. Warren Clark, and Dr. William Flynn at Carleton University, who have been some of my supporters in making this project happen. 